Fine cylinder in a weird way. So a cylinder, a surface generated by moving a line across a curve. So let's say your curve looks like this. So we're going to move a line across the curve. So just think of this as sort of the bottom point on a line. And we'll just keep drawing the line as it moves across the curve. Uh-oh. I drew that too tall, or my moving needs to move. I'll draw that shorter. So one, one way you can do it is just basically retrace your line, or retrace your curve directly above the original. And then periodically So the cylinder you're thinking of, which probably looks like a paper towel roll, what type of curve would you be drawing a line across? Circle. So take a circle and you just take a line and rotate around a circle, you have the cylinder you're thinking of. So this is sort of a generalized cylinder. So it doesn't have to be spun around a line, or spun around a circle. Now a plane is also a cylinder. What type of curve would you move a line across to get a plane? Move a line across a line. So a straight curve. Move a line across a straight curve and you'll have a plane. So if your, cur if your line is parallel to one of the axes that you're moving, it's a little easier to visualize. Otherwise, again, visualization is sort of useless if it's not moved parallel to one of the axes. Uh, if it's parallel to the z-axis, you have an xy curve, and then your line goes straight up out of there. That's probably the easiest one to visualize. So that's our first example that we'll be doing. So y equals x squared, that's our good friend the parabola. So we're going to look at the graph in Now normally we looked at the graph in R2, two dimensions, x, y plane. But we're going to look at the graph in uh, R3. So before we look at that, so certainly R3 has x, y, z coordinates. Is there any restriction on z, or anything involving z whatsoever in our equation? None at all. So that means z can be anything. Could be 0, could be positive, could be negative. So what I'm going to do first is graph the solution with z equals 0. And then what we're going to do is try to draw out what the rest of it would look like. So I'm going to, we're going to graph in three dimensions. So our y-axis goes to the right, our x-axis goes down to the left, of course our z-axis is going to go straight up. So I'm going to graph the curve when x equals 0. So the point zero, 0, is easy uh, one to see that's on here. So we'll write in the origin. And now, when y is 1, what does x have to be? Or negative 1. OK, 
Can't even label in the right spots. All right, negative one. They have three-dimensional graph paper, right? Yeah. You just print it out. Just look up three-D graph paper, and there's websites. Yeah. So it's basically graph paper with a diagonal axis, basically, right? It's not terribly fancy. Now, if you can see, I'm basically using diagonal axis up here. Our x-axis is a diagonal axis. So there's one one and one negative one. Or I said that wrong. There's there's one one, and the back point is negative one one. And of course, all of our z coordinates are zero right now. And we'll go out to y is four. We got two here and minus two up there. And we're going to draw a parabola now. Connect these up with a smooth curve. So you're lucky I don't suck at drawing. So that is supposed to be parallel with the xy plane. Now what we're going to do is use a different color. I'll go blue. And I'm going to draw the, so what I drew is the curve z equals 0. And of course, it keeps going. It's a parabola, so it goes out forever. And now we're going to draw uh, line segments parallel with the, uh, z, the z axis. So they're going to go straight up. Now, don't make them too tall, or you're going to run into your writing above. Now, the best way to do this is basically copy down what you have already but move it up the f a fixed amount. Looks like I'm, on my paper here, it's like a centimeter, obviously, on the board. It's quite a bit more than a centimeter. Let's say a decimeter. on the graph. So depending on if there is a restriction on z, like between, it looks like I probably drew it between 0 and 2. Obviously, you can't draw it forever, so you're not going to be able to draw an infinitely tall line. So, uh, so I just depicted it at 0 to 2, approximately. So there may be a restriction on that. If not, uh, you could just draw little arrows to the top and it goes forever, or you could sort of write a note to yourself. It just depends on what um, the problem is. So if these lines are parallel to one of the axes, you will, look, you will be able to write the equation without that coordinate in there. So if the lines are parallel to an axis, in our case it was z, then the equation can be written without that variable. And of course, our case was z. Now, why do I say can be written? Think of y equals x squared. If I want to do something silly and write y minus z equals x squared minus z, obviously I wrote it with the z coordinate, but I don't have to write it with the z coordinate. I could add z to both sides and eliminate it. So meaning there is a form 
that you could write without that Z coordinate in there. So you could just cancel out the Zs right here, and then you're back to where you started. So we have a couple uh, types of surfaces that we have names for. Linear surface, also called a plane. Now we define, on, when we talked about planes, we define it with dot products, but it written in this form, you could call this the general form. And what can you see right away in this form? And don't say A, B, C, and D. What? X, Y, Z. And an equal sign, and plus. But what information, what geometric information can you see? I know we have to go way back to last lecture. How about a normal? What's our normal to this plane? ABC. So yes, you can see ABC, but specifically they mean the normal direction to the plane. This last section, so I'm not going to rewrite it right here. But this is just called a linear surface or a plane. Quadratic surface. That should have been a D T T I C. So linear service obviously had it was a linear equation, so maximum power of x, y, and z are one. So a quadratic surface can have maximum power two. And if we write in terms of the, the order of the variables up here, we could write it as ax squared plus bx plus cy squared plus dy plus ez squared plus fz equals g. So it's similar except there could be some quadratic terms, meaning some squared terms. Now in my notes, I have types of quadratic surfaces. Ooh, it's OI. Ellipsoids, so what does an ellipse look like? A flat circle or a tall circle? What I'm not gonna do is draw all the vertical lines coming out of it. So there's an ellipse, and then you would just draw vertical lines. So we got ellipsoids, paraboloids, and of course that is a parabola where that's the one that we drew above. So we drew a paraboloid. Ellipsoids, paraboloids, hyperboloids. Hyperboloids, so hyperbolas. It looks a lot like a double parabola. It has a slightly different uh, shape to it, but it looks really similar to a double paraboloid. Now I have an elliptical cone written down. Anybody know elliptical cone off the top of their head? There might be a good picture in the book. Yeah, it's like an hourglass. An hourglass? Ah, yes, no, I know. All right. <coughs> like that? OK. Now, why do they call it elliptical cone? Because uh, what I drew is, at least my mind is thinking of a circular cone. But the bases I drew don't have to be circles. They could be ellipses. So they could be squished or stretched and 
one way. So they don't have to be perfect circles. So there's an elliptical cone. All right, so these are all cylinders. Wait, is that true? They're quadratic surfaces. I don't think the elliptical cone is a cylinder, though, because the lines don't come right out of a uh, curve. Oh, the lines don't have to be parallel according to our definition. So if your lines don't have to be parallel, then the elliptical cone is also a cylinder. So you could take the base to be the curve you want to draw around, and then just say I'm drawing lines out of there that all go through that point right there. And then you've traced out the definition of a cylinder. You have your curve, and then every line going uh, through your curve also goes through that single point, and you've drawn a cylinder. You have to be careful, you learn math words, you can't really use them around normal people because their definition of a cylinder is uh, very limited. Okay, ellipsoid, which is separate from these right here. They have pictures of all these in the book, right? Yeah, page So, page 699? So you could have a look in your book for other pictures. So it's page 699. So here's an ellipsoid equation. And we're going to graph this out. Now I want to graph the point on the x-axis. What value or what variables or coordinates are zero on the x-axis? So on the x-axis, what coordinates have to be zero? So that's a tricky question. Apparently, let's think about this point right here. So you're on the x-axis. So our z-value better be 0, or else I'd be above the x-axis. What about y-value? 0, or else I'd be too far to the right or left. But z, or x, certainly doesn't have to be 0. That could be anything, still be on the x-axis. So our particular solution on the x-axis, our x would not necessarily have to be 0, but our y and z are both 0. So we'll look at on. So remember, we looked at x and y intercepts before. Now we're going to have x intercepts, y intercepts, z intercepts, if you really want to graph. All right, on the x-axis, so, so you can call this our x-intercept, y equals 0 and z equals 0. So that means you're on the x-axis. And it's very easy. This particular equation is very easy to solve when x and y are 0. What does x have to equal? Plus or minus a. That's it. Very easy equation. x squared equals a squared, which means they're equal or negatives. So they go out a, go out the other way a. So there's a and minus a. Let's go on y-axis. We're going to find our y-intercept. What coordinates will be 0 if we're on our y-axis? So the other two, z and x. So z and x equals 0. So x equals 0, z equals 0. And I think we can just look at the original equation and say y equals b or minus b. So the same thing happens. Now I don't know how big b is compared to a, so I'm just going to pretend like I do and write something here. We'll say b and go the same amount to the left. That'll be minus b. Keep 
drawing it too close to the z-axis. There we go, that's perfect. Ish. All right, what about z? You can do the same thing on the z-axis. x0, y0, and you're on the z-axis. I should label these. Minus b, regular b. Put your labels a little bit further away from the origin because you're going to be drawing some circles, and I don't want to interfere with drawing circles here. So it'll be up at c and down at minus c. Now we're going to connect all these together with a bunch of, I guess you can call them skewed ellipses. <coughs> so we're basically drawing ellipses, three of them. We're going to draw one. We'll do the first one. The first one will be easy. We'll do it on the yz plane. So the first one we're going to draw is on the yz plane. This one's easy because uh, we're looking directly at it. So go from c to b to negative c to negative b back to c. Now for the trickier ones, all right on the uh, x, y plane now. So I'm going between a, b, negative a, negative b, back to a. So this is the one parallel with the ground. And last up, we'll connect. We got CB, AB. We'll go AC now. And this is where it's going to get a little ugly because there's a lot of circles hanging out right next to each other. Oh, I'll just go to use red. That'll work. So I'm going CA, negative C, negative A. So uh, once I had a toy that was called a gyroscope, this thing still exists? Yes. So it's sort of what you're drawing, although I think that would be, everything's probably a circle on your gyroscope, or maybe an ellipse in one dimension, but they're generally three circles going around, uh, and the inside one spins. Anyways, you're kind of trying to draw that. And if you haven't had one, you should talk to somebody who just said yes, because they're cool. <laughs> well, if one of you has one, if you bring it in, that'd be awesome. Sweet. So you can bounce it on a pen. It's really neat. All right, ellipsoid. So the next one, if you're into horses, you'll be very happy. This is called a hyperbolic paraboloid. It's the scariest name. And it looks a lot like a horse saddle. Horse saddle? Or a, a minimum. It'll have a minimum in one dimension and a maximum in another, depending on which ways you look. All right, it's called a hyperbolic paraboloid. I will not grade you on your drawing skills. If you're not a good drawer, you don't need to worry. I don't think that's even a word, so it's certainly something you shouldn't worry about. I meant to put a squared under x squared, so it has some consistency. <coughs> and we want c to be greater than 0. 
Certainly, you don't want a, b, or c to ever equal zero, or else that'll screw up the you know dividing by that number, and it'll be undefined. Uh, but in this case, if c is negative, you would swap the role of x and y. You turn those around, uh, and then what graph we draw, you would swap the x and y axis. So it would sort of go down on one axis on the x-axis, let's say, and up on the y, or vice versa. So draw your coordinate axes. And if you don't like what you're drawing, just look in your uh, textbook. They'll have really nice pictures there. OK, so our cross section, when x equals 0, we will have, so well, first of all, what happens when x is 0? So obviously, there's the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. So when x equals 0, what plane are we on? So the yz. So I'm doing this one first because it's the one that's basically flat, and we get to draw it without thinking about perspective. So it's the easier one to draw. So when x equals 0, I'm just going to put in 0 for x. We got y squared over b squared minus 0 equals z over c. So if I solve for z, z equals c over b squared y squared. So this is actually a quadratic. So it'll be a parabola, and it'll be going It'll be opening up on the z-axis. So certainly 0, 0 is a solution. That's easy to see. I'm ignoring x because I assumed x was 0. So I'm not worried about going forward or backwards on this part of the graph. Now if y is plus or minus 1, our z uh, will be whatever c over b squared is. So it won't necessarily be 1. Let's just pretend that that's, well, whatever I go to the right. And left, I'll just go up some amount. I don't want to go up one because what's in my notes has a, le a smaller slope than that. Oh, no. So don't copy these two points down. If you are good at either drawing in 3D or looking in 3D, what plane did I draw those two points on? The XY plane because I went sort of diagonal back from them, not straight up. So I need to go straight up from those two. I put the right marks on my y-axis, but I should have gone straight up from there, not across. There we go. So I went straight up from those two points. And now, just draw a parabola. And I want to draw this parabola without it being very steep, so a very gentle parabola, something like this. Those points are even higher up than I wanted them to be. So that was x is 0. We'll go for, uh, let's go for y is 0. All right, what do we get when y is 0? Well. The whole y squared term disappears, so we get minus x squared over a squared equals z over c. And let's solve for z. So z is negative c over a squared times x squared. So it's definitely a parabola. It'll be a parabola in the z, in the z x plane. So it'll be way harder to draw. It's going to come out of the board and go back into the board. Now c we assume to be positive. a squared is always positive, so that whole term is positive, except there's a negative sign in front of it. So that means it's a sad parabola. So it's a sad parabola on the xz plane. So we still get 0, 0 solution. When x is 1 and negative 1, we get z is whatever in the world negative c over a squared is. So we'll just, I'll just pick some value on the graph. So we go 1 and negative 1 in the x-axis. So we got our solution at the origin. So 
I'm now going to go straight down from these two dashed lines. So I'm supposed to be on that XZ plane, the diagonal plane. So I'm trying to draw straight down from those marks that I put on the axis. And now we're going to draw a parabola. And this one's a little weird because it's we're looking at it not straight on. So it's not going to look like a regular parabola. That doesn't give me the right feeling. <laughs> Actually, looking at what's in my notes, I'm going to choose two points that are lower down. Okay. Still doesn't look like my notes very much. Let's go look up hyperbolic paraboloid on the internet. How about that? <laughs> I can draw the one that's flat, like with a nice head-on perspective. Hyperbolic paraboloid. Hooper. Hyper. Oh, wow. Apparently, who would have guessed? It's a Pringles joke. Oh, it's a Pringle. Yeah, or a horse saddle. <laughs> oh, oh, that's exact Pringle chip right there in the <laughs> second row. Some of these are not hyperbolic paraboloids. I just want you to be aware of that. So where's a good? All right, all these are pretty good. Let's. This one? <laughs> that one? All right. So let's pretend I drew this. Oh, yeah. Oh, pixelated. All right, so that's what I was trying to draw. Now this one doesn't, this view is askew from every axis. So there's no, pra there's no, like the red parabola, uh, parabola on here is not, we're not looking at that one head on. But I think this should make some sense right here. And over on the left, no, you can see that on the screen, yeah. This left parabola here, uh, now it, that would have a, let's see, a y coordinate that's negative. So what that does, it basically has a different, it's an offset. So it's going to move it, the parabola to the left. Uh, and if, same thing, the one on the right, just move the parabola to the right. Now, it's a little tricky to see, but even the, you see the green curves at the very bottom down here? They're not parabolas, they're actually hyperbolas right there. So hyperbolas, they have a slightly different shape, but they're basically two parabolas uh, opposing each other. They're not exactly the parabola shape, but they have, they're similar. So I think, can I just say look at the book in the notes and you can copy it down? All right, let's do that. Um, if you use thin paper, like a cheap paper, or if you use tracing paper, you can just lay it right on top of your book and then draw exactly right off your book. So that's a reasonable thing to do. And the, I have a table, 12.1 will have graphs.
I'll just finish this off quickly for completeness. I know it's already ugly. <coughs> it's like a saggy tent. Oh. <laughs> and now I need to try to connect the left part of each of these, and I better use a different pen. And also the right parts. Ooh. But where on the right part? I think I need to go up to the right. So like there. There. No. I think the one in the middle should be up or down? Down? Okay. Hopefully right. All right, so we'll go blue. I'm way more confident about the front one than the back one. <coughs> Anyways, that's about the best I can do right now. So again, look in your book. You'll get a much better picture. So that's the end of chapter 12. Which means it's time to get back to calculus. Yes. Well, that's nice. <laughs> so this is chapter 13. What is the title of chapter 13.1? <laughs> I know it's limits. Uh, 3D? Curves in space and their tangents. Curves in space and their tangents. He's got progressively worse. So I was writing. I was thinking about the end square bracket or diamond bracket. You have better. Can you write the title up here? Curves in space and and their tangents. All right. So we're going to find a limit. Do you know how to find the limit of each three each of these three pieces separately? So our R of t function, cos t, sine t, and t. So. These are really nice functions individually. They're continuous. There's no divide by zero. It's not like it's secant and uh, cosecant where you have to worry, ah, am I going to be divided by zero? This is going to be a very easy, straightforward problem. Thank you, sir. So we're going to find the limit right now as t approaches whatever I wrote there, pi over 4. Yep. So I'm just going to write r of t in its place. So each individual piece is continuous. So when your function is continuous, you can just plug in the value. Let's do a really, really fast review. All right, what does it mean for a function f to be continuous at x equals a? There's one of you in here I don't want to answer. And if you don't know if it's you or not, it's not you. Definition of continuous. There's only three definitions I made you remember from calculus class. Limit, continuous, and def uh, derivative. It's 
part of it. And what does it equal? F of A. So limit matches or equals value. Then you're continuous. So you could pass V lim through continuous functions. What do I mean by that? Lim x approaches A f of x is f of lim x approaches a of x. That limit on the right is super easy. What's the limit of uh, x as x approaches a? a? A. So that's just f of a right there. So it's going to be f of a. So this is what I call passing limit through a continuous function. We're going to do that. Uh, so we're going to first pass it through. This is basically just putting three functions together with square bracket around it. So we got cos pi over 4, sine pi over 4, and just pi over 4 itself. Cos pi over 4 and sine pi over 4 are 1 over square root 2. 2 comma pi over 4. So let's write down our continuous definition for uh, higher dimensions. So function r from the real numbers to n dimensions. So our function is going to eat real numbers and it's going to output an n dimensional vector or a point, depending on how you want to think of it. So this function is continuous at t naught if lim t approaches t naught r of t equals r of t naught. So this is exactly the definition that we had for regular continuous. The only difference is you're comparing the output of the function is n dimensions and the r of t naught is n dimensions. So there's really n separate equations you have to match up. So this is a vector equality right here. So there's really n components on each one. So n components, the first component has to match the first component. So there's really n equations, n things that have to match up. So n components must match. So I said the word continuous, I'll write it once and then never again. Hopefully that's spelled right. Continuous. No? <laughs> Which there's one that too many vowels, huh? U instead of the I before the O. Oh. Let me just erase the three vowels and then you tell me which two should go in. <laughs> Because you owe you? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you owe you? Are you sure? Yeah. All right. You've taken English way more recently than I have. Probably by two decades. <laughs> All right, so that's continuous. Now, I underline continuous. I should have underlined this is continuous at a point or at just a single value. So next thing we did in Calc 1 was continuous on an interval. And so you're continuous on interval if you're continuous at each point in the interval. Oh, I shouldn't use F if I'm using R before. Okay, R is continuous at 
continuous on AB if all T inside AB R is continuous at T. So look at every single T in the interval. If you're continuous at all the T's, then you're continuous on the interval.